So basically, I'm here to talk about some things that I really hope to inspire you to uh, um, stay awesome, as Jill said early on. So uh, residency and, and patient care can be frustrating. Um, so I'm here to try to do a few things. I have no disclosures other than I'm strongly biased toward uh, teaching and uh, patient-centered care. So that's my bias, but have no financial disclosures. Um, why'd you go to medicine? You'll have to say something. So I asked for interaction. So uh, somebody, why'd you go into medicine? I guess okay. I can always speak. I'm Mar Wilson, child psychiatry. Hi. Um, I went into it because I really loved my pediatrician and I wanted to be like them. Awesome. That's fantastic. And uh, Greg, you and Joe both know, what What do I kind of hope y'all will say at least at some point in your training? Because we care about people. Exactly. And we want to help people. Help people. You, you don't really sound enthusiastic like that, but that's okay. I mean, first year medical students, the first day is like to help people. And after that, it's like, whatever, to help people. Yeah, because I care. Um, so we kind of beat it out of you, but you went into medicine because you do care about people. Um, hopefully you want to be patient centered and team based. Um, I, I know that, uh, some of what I want to cover are those aspects as well as, um, what does it mean to be patient centered in terms of communication? And I want to talk a little bit about some evidence. I'll, 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 I'll cite a few articles. I'm not going to go into them, but the, I do have links on the PowerPoint that uh, you could use, but we won't do that today. And I'm hoping to prevent some attitude shifts um, and maybe implement you back toward hopefulness, because I think that's something that disappears over time in the system that we're in. So a patient centeredness is really all about some things that should be near and dear to your heart in psychiatry. It's about relationships and it's about stories. And that's really what, what our, our care of patients is all about. In addition, though, I think there has to be some um, social responsibility, aspects of service, and we have to do it as teams now. This is really where we are. We can't do this individually, and you never are. And this is one of my favorite quotes. It's not patient-centered until the patient says it's patient-centered. We do a lot of things that don't really engage our patients. Um, so uh, what is a, a, a PCMH, anybody? So it's a patient-centered medical home. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, I'm really, really good at silence, and I will sit there and wait until people get super uncomfortable, although it's a lot more fun to, to do it in person. Yeah, Shababi. Oh, well, I was going to, I was trying to think that it's a patient-centered mental health, but I know, I knew that was wrong because I had talked to you about it before, and so this is where automatically a psychiatrist goes to. I, I see that. Yeah, the MH, mental health. Yeah. But <laughs> the PCMH is one thing and it improves your payment. So it's an important thing to do. And in family medicine, we all became PCMH certified. And one thing you had to do was to have extended hours. Um, so Kingsport was open Thursday nights for, um, for a few extra hours. Was that because all of our patients said, oh, God, please be open Thursday night. That's really the night we need open. No, it was because it was the only night we could afford to do it because we couldn't staff afford the, the salaries for staff to be there on Saturdays. We couldn't be there every night. So we made a decision to get PCMH, Patients Center Medical Home Certification, based on what was best for us and not what was best for our patients. So that's one of the challenges of how do you ensure you're meeting your patients' needs? And it's not always easy, especially in the limitations we face in education and, and practice. Um, a lot of what we do is based on us. Um, it's really about our convenience. It's about our, our aspects, even though we're transforming. Where are we located? When are we open? Who will we see? What insurances do we accept? I love auto attendance. Not, um, you know, <laughs> hi, uh, press one to be ignored in English, press two to be ignored in Spanish. Um, you know, it's just, it's just kind of crazy how we don't have human beings involved, but this is a lot of our current reality. Um, when you can be seen, when are our hours open, um, all of those things. Um, I put healthcare system in quotes, and it's from uh, somebody named Walter Cronkite. Many of you are way too young to remember Walter Cronkite, but uh, does anybody know who Walter Cronkite was? I see a lot of heads shaking. The, the challenge was- news anchor? Yes, he was actually a news anchor back in the time where you had both news 
and an anchor person you trusted because they would give you news and not just a talking head who would shout at you. Uh, this was in the 60s. Walter Cronkite basically said, um, I think he was the first to say healthcare system in quotes because it's not about health, it's not very caring, and it's not much of a system. And I think that's kind of where we still are despite our efforts. We're really stuck in some challenges. And we provide a lot of physician or provider-centered care. Um, it's, again, what, what we will provide or not. Do we do MAT? Do we not? Uh, do we do hospital service or call? Um, how do you lose access to us? You know, if you don't show up several times, we'll kick you out. If you're on the wrong drug, we'll kick you out. If you violate this contract, we'll kick you out. And I, I'm not saying you don't have, you shouldn't have those things. But a lot of this is really about us and not about patients. And it's a shift that I think really um, is one I would encourage. But we were overseen by a lot of non-patient-centered regulators, including the payers, the insurance, a lot of our state and federal regulations. And I'm afraid residency often. Um, there's some real difficulties, uh, even in our family medicine practice. I can't tell you how many times, almost every time I'm precepting, I'll be sitting there with the residents and I'll have a chart in front of me, the, the, patient, the resident's presenting a patient. And it turns out that patient's doctor is a different resident. Okay, that happens, except that resident is in clinic that day. And somehow we never connected the patient with supposedly their primary doc. So in many ways, residency doesn't create the opportunity for that relationship and that story that we say is so important. Um, I think taking the history is super important um, as I, I'm sure you do as well, but we don't have as much personal connection with our patients. Um, plus taking it is fairly aggressive. I love this concept. I wish I could tell you who's, who mentioned it to me first, but maybe we should receive the history instead of taking it because words are powerful. And how do you approach working with your patients? Could you be open to hearing and receiving their story instead of taking it? Because we always talk about patients being poor historians, maybe because it's I'm a poor listener. And it's more often than not, that's really the problem. And we only emphasize certain parts of the history anyway. So I'll ask you, social history, what parts are we really exploring with social history? What are the most important things that we, we're gonna just summarize quickly? And be careful, I'm gonna start calling on people. So uh, Sukhvinder, what are the, uh, what? oh, James, wait, you unplugged, James. You were about to say yeah, something. I was gonna, you know, like living, uh, living situation for us, uh, substance use, um, okay. like marriage, how many kids they have. Okay, I That's really, I have, you're looking at some of those. You said the magic word though, which was drugs. Cause in so many ways in medical school, especially, and in lots of residencies, the first thing is tobacco, alcohol, and drugs. And we don't get into social history. We don't even know how to explore supports. And if we had more time and in person, I'd be saying, how do you how do you really get into this? Because I think we've taught you some bad habits and they work for us, but they're not really patient-centered. So this really is the social history we focus on. And there are lots of lists and templates driven by our electronic record. Again, words are important. I think it's a his or her story uh, for a reason. We don't call it a her story, but we should. This is really what we we need to get from our patients, but we're not we're not emphasizing getting those stories other than the way that we want it to check the boxes. And this is a danger of an EBR. What's an EBR? What's an EHR? Evidence-based record, I guess. I don't oh. know what the R is. Yeah, so EHR, electronic health record, EMR, electronic medical record. Um, I happen to be occasionally in meetings and at tables where I get to talk to people who make decisions about such things. And um, what, what I would do is say, hey, the EBR. And when you're in a meeting with executives and you use an acronym they don't know, they'll often say, excuse me, what, what's uh, EBR? And I'll say, thanks for asking. Electronic billing record, because it has nothing to do with health. And then I drop the mic and walk out of the room because I've made my point. Um, the reality is our records are not about health. They're, they're not. Um, they're all about billing. They're to, to provide to our payers evidence that we're not committing fraud. And I'm a little simplistic of it, but the, the record is all about billing. It's not about patient care. You just check boxes. Uh, we don't really write notes anymore. Now, you do. And a lot of what what um, you do and, and, and what I would hope other good clinicians will do is to write some things, especially in terms of differential. The electronic record does not create a checkbox 
or differentials. It's only about what you know, diagnosis, and then plan. And you really have to discuss more, especially when you're dealing with mental and behavioral health. There's a lot of conversation. So I know you write more than most uh, clinicians, but your notes are restricted. So I sometimes have trouble finding them or reading them or seeing them, and yet they're critical. So we don't even communicate about our patients well with each other without making sure we sign all the right forms. And again, I'm not saying we should not do that, but it creates some hurdles for patient care. Um, we don't communicate well. How much time do we allow patients to tell their story before we interrupt and take control? Michael. Statistically, a few seconds. A few seconds, that's exactly, I like, statistically, yeah, it's uh, really about 15 seconds. Now, I'm a family physician. I'm so much better. You know how much time I let a patient talk at the family doc? 18 seconds. That's 20% more time. You know, that's, you can get through a lot more on your list. And I'm kind of being facetious, but the reality is we really do take control of interviews quickly. And we're going to spend a little time talking about that. Now, I can't speak 100% with what y'all do, but I'm gonna ask you a few questions soon. And you notice I'm, I'm gonna start calling on some of you. Um, cause I, and by the way, if you're able to, I'd love to see your faces um, just cause I'm, I'm peri periodically scrolling through things. So thank you, appreciate you putting some, uh, some uh, uh, faces up. And I see a few of our medical students too. So you're, you're, not, uh, you're, you're not immune from being called on either. Um, but a lot of what we do is because of oversight and, and other aspects, and it's all about billing. Again, this is not about patient care. So the patient interview is important because you've got to get stuff. You do have to figure out what's going on with your patients, and you've got to explore um, that information. You've got to generate rapport. You've got to maintain it over time. You have to get in a relationship right away because you've got to find a way to get that patient to trust you now, but also hopefully long term. So there's a lot that goes on in your interactions with patients. Um, unfortunately, in many ways, we've emphasized physical exams and we uh, focus on labs and studies. Um, that may not be as critical in some of the psychiatric care um, other than acute emergencies, but it's still a component. And it's one that our patients recognize when they access the, the system in lots of other places. This is something I really work with our medical students on, which is think through what do you think is going on? That directs your history first, then your physical, and then you resort to labs and things later, um, but certainly not right away. But that's a lot of what happens. We're very much high tech and low touch. And I, re I realize touch is risky and you got to be very cautious in all environments, make sure it's appropriate touch. And should you hug people? Yes or no. Should you shake hands in the days of COVID? Should you reach out and touch someone's name? And there are always variables that we have to be analyzing. Uh, but we've, we've moved toward technology and away from our patients. And uh, it's changed our relationship. And I think COVID has reinforced that in ways that are is negative in, in many aspects. All right, residents and students, what's the uh, triple aim? Kenny Pomeroy, any idea? I have no idea. All right, uh, Shook Vendor, any idea? Dr. I couldn't quite hear that. I'm so sorry. You broke up a little. Oh, I was saying, did you say what is the triple lane? The triple aim, yes. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Clay, do you remember? I think that was uh, individual care and then there's the population uh, and then cost, is that right? Kind of, sort of, maybe. So basically, triple aim is uh, the issues of poor outcomes, poor satisfaction uh, for both providers and patients and high cost. The triple aim was, the, the motivation for changing the way we were practicing care. The move toward team-based care was all about, we have horrible outcomes for incredibly high cost and no one likes the system. It's now called the quadruple aim because of the provider satisfaction, which was left out before. I bring this up because your legislators know this terminology and a lot of moves toward changing how healthcare is provided is based on addressing these components of the triple or quadruple aim. And so again, everything we do should be to improve outcomes, improve satisfaction of everybody, and at lower cost. 
So th that's really the driving factors for uh, for what's happening. But we have a lot of partisan politics which get in the way of that. Um, but they really are still the drivers. So there's some things in the psychiatric literature that I, I found interesting because the National Council for Mental Well-Being uh, talks about optimizing your workflow within team-based care. Uh, this was uh, published in January 2021 and looks at community behavioral health clinics. And I know that's not the same as a residency, but um, they really did look at and, and recognize that team-based care improves quality of care and outcomes, um, the experiences, um, costs, and that's the triple aim and the quadruple aim. So there are things in your literature that, again, may not be readily translatable to a residency program, but still should be driving some of the conversations within your department. How can you work on these kinds of issues? And by the way, a PowerPoint presentation for me today doesn't fix it, but I hope it may stimulate some discussion if it's not already happening. Um, in addition, there was a recent review by Dr. Jennifer McWilliams about team care for children and adolescents ideally in the patient-centered medical home, where you get comprehensive care, patient-centered care, coordinated care, accessible services, quality and safety improvement, um, with telepsychiatry as a component of it. Now, this is something we could be and should be talking about more in some of our other clinics. Family medicine residency programs have uh, psychiatry residents rotating through. That's a great way of trying to really dive into the comprehensive patient-centered care, but coordinated care with other providers. I don't think we do that as well as we could either. I think there are opportunities for your department and family medicine and others to work better together. I think pediatrics is another place where that could happen. So there's some opportunities for us moving forward with things that even your own organizations are saying are important. So the provider and now we really need to be patient centered. I wish we could focus on health. Obviously, most of the time uh, when we're involved, you're, you're not dealing with people who are, who are in a great place of health. I mean, if you're seeing a patient, there's a problem. Um, so a lot of this is, is just challenging for our patients because we do have to deal with acute issues. We have to have relationships. And again, team base would keep coming up. And, and I hope we'll have a little time at the end to see kind of where you are. We have to use technology and find a way to be compassionate with it. How do you make a Zoom um, session with a patient work? And it's a skill. And it's another one we have to figure out how do we teach in medical school and residency? You know, there are a lot of personal choices that are part of this. And a lot of this is reframing. Um, when you're having a disagreement with somebody, you can always reframe to what's best for our patient and make it to our patient. Because physicians, clinicians all disagree. We have many opinions. How we do things is different. So residents, have you noticed that your attendings maybe have a little bit of different practice style and different uh, ways of teaching? You can do a thumbs up emoji or something. And you don't have to give specifics because I don't want you to get in trouble. I'm not seeing anybody do anything, but I know the reality. We all do it different. And I, thank you, Sean, you're, you're nodding your head. You know, I, I tell people that uh, we make you crazy because I'm attending, I'll do it this way. Then somebody else will say, don't do it that way, do it this way. And your response is to go, okay. Um, so it's a real challenge. And for me, so much of this is the art and you each get to choose your own masterpieces. You can't do things the way I do it. You'll be able to do some things that I never would. Um, this is really about figuring out your style um, as best you can. And this is for some of your own health, but also how do you do this in your practice? Can you surround yourself with meaningful relationships? Um, this should be at home and at work. And we all kind of do this, we gravitate. Can you put stuff around you that's meaningful? When I, uh, when I started at the Kingsport residency and, and was in a position as a faculty, I put Japanese silk screens on the wall and they were beautiful. Gosh, they were great. And the kids would draw on them. And that wasn't quite my plan, but it, it worked. And then I said, okay, I'm going to do something. I, I decided I would get the uh, home medics fountains. Those are the things you can buy at like Walmart. They're very inexpensive and they're wonderful. And I put it in the room and OSHA said, no. And I went, what? And they said, death. I said, what? Legionella. Because water in a clinical room was not appropriate. So, you know, those fountains are stupid when they don't have water in them. They're kind of gray and they turn whitish. They just, it did not work. So I had to get rid of the fountains. So then I put in, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to serve tea and coffee to my patients. So I put a little water thing in my clinical suite. My nurse helped me. It was fantastic. And OSHA went, no, burns. And I'm like, what? 
So you couldn't have hot water in the clinical area. So we put it somewhere else and my nurse still served it. And I realized it was still an OSHA violation, but there was a point I finally said, whatever. Nothing changed the encounters I had with some of my patients, including difficult ones, than walking into a room and having them drinking tea. Now, this was decades ago, and I know, again, OSHA violation to drink or eat in the area. I'm not encouraging y'all to do that. I'm just sharing a personal story about how I looked at my environment to create something more comfortable for my patients and for myself. And I can tell you anecdotally, I didn't do a study. It made a difference. It was really important. I think be careful about other things that might inadvertently cause stress. A lot of what we consider humorous is usually at the expense of somebody. So you got to be really careful. If you look at cartoons, it's often making fun of somebody or a group of people or something. So just be careful about it um, because we often surround ourselves at work with things that make us smile, but some of those things may actually have a flip side to be aware of. And then there's personal power. You know, what kind of image are you presenting and how's it working? So y'all can't see me right now. Some of you know me, many of you have run into me. And, you know, right now I'm, you know, wearing a nice, I have a, a nice jacket, I've got a nice tie, my beard is groomed. But if you ran into me on a Saturday when I'm doing work at home and I have to run to Lowe's and I'm wearing dirty jeans and a t-shirt that's sweaty and I got a buff on my head and I'm walking down the street, um, I doubt many of you would cross the street to come talk to me. Because if you looked at that, what words come to mind that you might be thinking if you didn't know me, but you just saw that image? Because I'm about six foot tall, I weigh 220, and I'm kind of scary. I get earrings, hair in a ponytail. So what kind of words come to mind? Especially if you see me talking like this, I'm going down the street going, what comes to mind? Philip, something came to your mind because you just got a big smile. Oh, it looked like some florid psychosis. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you're crazy. Yeah, thank you for making it clinical. Yeah, you're crazy. Um, any other words come to mind? Eminent family practitioner. Oh, yeah, you're very kind, Greg. That's just because you know me. Most people would go drug dealer, um, homeless. Yeah, and I'm a drug dealer. I'm licensed in two states um, to uh, to prescribe drugs. Um, and of course, I'm talking that way because I've got a Bluetooth, but with this beard, you can't see it. In fact, I swore I'd never get one of those because I know people would think I was nuts because you can't see it with all the hair. So it's just that issue. Now, I, I recognize how I can come across, but I promise you, especially when taking care of patients, I make sure it works and I don't scare people. I scare students and learners, but, but not my patients. So you got to be aware of how do you come across and is it working? Is it doing what you want? Because that's a big part of it. Everything carries meaning. Um, there are a lot of symbols that we are surrounded with. Our coats, stethoscopes, smartphones, computers and tablets. You know, the background, if you're Zooming, is it going to be professional or not? Um, and then there's some other aspects that go along with that, such as clothes. Now, uh, some of you have, have, uh, have experienced this. Some of you have not. So, And it's hard. I wish I was in person. But if you're looking, so here I am, and I'm wearing a tie. And this is my tie. And if you're precepting with me, you know, does that look like a happy, happy idea? Is, is it, am I somebody you want to talk to? Yeah. Okay. But look at the bottom of the tie. What do you see? That's the Tasmanian devil ripping a happy face in half. Is this really, yeah, Greg, your eyebrows went up. Is this really a wonderful image if you're a learner? You're going to come precept with me and wait a minute. Oh my God, is this the day I lose my face? So maybe that's not the right tie. For me to have so maybe i should have this one now this is gorgeous look at the colors if you can it's uh, it's blue and pink and purple and can you see what's on it yeah this is the scream which is in a multi-million dollar painting it's gorgeous i bought this tie for real i love this tie um however it's four o'clock in the morning i'm rounding in the hospital i have this face and this tie and you wake up to that that's kind of scary so even though it goes with every everything I own, the colors are beautiful. Again, I wish I could show it, but there we are. Um, I, I realize that's probably not the right tie to wear. So maybe I, I shouldn't wear that. So maybe, okay, here we go. What do you think of that one? Yeah, again, thumbs up. Most of the time people go, oh, it's Winnie the Pooh. How can you not like a Winnie the Pooh tie? It's fantastic. Except I was elected president of the American Academy of Family Physicians to represent my members in Washington, D.C. advocating 
for better pay and better care for our patients. And I look like this and I have a Winnie the Pooh tie. How, how professional and serious am I? So I said, okay, maybe that's not the right tie either. So maybe I'll just go with Jerry Garcia. You know, nice colors, goes with everything. Um, you know, don't get the, the thumbs up necessarily, but I also don't freak people out. And so the point there is what you wear, how you carry yourself has meaning. How many of you chose a particular color or piece of jewelry when you interviewed for your residency? Yeah, I'm seeing a few nods and things. So um, who's willing to share that you did and why you did it? I know I wear blue because um, it's a relaxing color. And then in my office, I wear green just because it's calm and it's also my favorite color and it matches my office. So, oh. you know, and there are actually studies to show that colors do have different impacts. You know, what color is the best sleeping pill? Blue? They Baby blue. blue, baby blue helps you to sleep. What's a good color for a pain medicine? It's supposed to be red. red. Red, oh my God, super powerful. I mean, and you know, we laugh and that nowadays, of course we have generics and they're all white, but there was a time you could, I mean, you would make some choices and people would, would um, market to you based on things like color. So anyway, all these things have meaning and they have for humans forever. Spiritual images, jewelry, decorations, all of these things are part of how we communicate, often non-verbally. Um, and it's something I know you as, as mental health professionals pay attention to. How do people dress? Are they paying attention to their appearance or not? You know, what kinds of things? Do they have a, a hat that's over their head? All of these things are part of the message. So just be aware of that. But also be um, attentive to your affect, you know, because perspective is, is key in so many ways. So uh, how many of you, and I, I won't be able to see because I can't get the gallery screen to be big enough. How, raise your hand or put a thumbs up if you're a, a half full kind of person. Okay, I see a few hands, a whole bunch of you still have no cameras and aren't doing emojis. Boo, there we go, there's a thumbs up. All right, let's try the other. How many of you say you're uh, half empty? Okay, I see a, a few, I really can't tell. And if I'm in the room, I can read the room. Most of the time I have noticed that there are a lot more half empties, which means I really piss you off because I'm super full. I'm not half full, I'm a lot more. And someone like me, I know does not come across well um, or, or always pleasantly to, to have uh, empty people. Now this is, by the way, uh, while this is important, both approaches work. This isn't something's better or worse, but it does impact. Um, so I'm very half full. How did I change myself? Um, I often have emails that are flowery or full of information or very positive. And I had a partner who, uh, when I would say, hey, it's all good. I had this partner say to me, it is not all good. And we had a great conversation. I wasn't surprised. I knew she was half empty and I was half full. But I realized that whenever I sent some of my emails as program director, I had to do that. It didn't have the impact I needed because people were getting an emotional button push. So what I did in the subject line of my emails was put glass half full warning. And so half empty people could look at the subject line and go, I am not reading this right now because I'll kill him. Or they go, they get a little smile or go, okay. And they've been warned and they could read it and it would work. And I found that helped me in my communication with others because I recognized my approach wasn't going to work for everybody. And you each have that opportunity as well. Can you can you pay attention to what's going on in your team and recognize that maybe you could make some changes? Don't always expect other people to do it. But again, this is not about right or wrong. It's just what works for you. It impacts patient care. It impacts team-based care. Patients can tell your mood. Um, so a lot of components with this. So I'm about to give you a glass half full warning. All right. Remember, you always have a choice. Today is yours for a reason. And the challenges you face are the teachers of the moment. And those of you who are half full are saying, Reed, would you shut up? You're making us look really bad. Because I know that's that cloying part of being half full. I mean, I put inspirational posters up in my practice. And I had one partner who happily was just in his office, but he put one up that said, nothing says loser like an inspirational poster. So it was a fun conversation when I said, is that really the message you want to give to residents in your office? But yeah, you know, we had different approaches. So it's a fascinating process. But remember, you chose to help people, but they're hardly ever at their best when you see them. 
And that's a reality too. We've got to be careful. I'm a cheerleader, but if I've got a depressed patient, you can't cheer someone out of depression. And if anything, it makes it worse. I've got to be able to modulate where I am for that person's mood or their affect or their approach in order to make that connection. So very interesting process. I think not around patients. Laughing around patients can be dangerous because they think you're laughing at them. But finding ways of laughing with each other and, and um, relaxing stuff is important. I think that's good for health. Please recognize that all treatments have a specific effect, um, also have some healing effect, and then counters have potential effect. A lot of this is basically bedside manner, um, which we recognize is not always there. Uh, I'm, normally, I'd ask people for stories about folks who didn't have anybody who was uh, uh, if somebody you want to emulate. People always raise their hands. What's interesting is I, I say, is there somebody you never want to be like? People's hands go up faster because those, those have a lot of impacts on us. Don't be like them. This is your chance in residency to be deciding what is your style? How do you come across? Are you going to be one of those, those uh, clinicians that, that medical students and other residents and patients look at and say, that's the kind of person I want to be. This is your opportunity during residency, especially. You know, how do you use your communication skills um, to advantage and for time management? Because I know y'all y'all have some limitations, but I think it's different. So how much time when you're seeing a patient in clinic, how much time do you generally have when you're when you're doing your patient care in the outpatient setting? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. How much time do I have usually? I'm guessing less. Yeah, less than that. Usually we're, we're usually 15 minute blocks or 20 minute blocks. It's a very different approach. Um, so thank God. I'm Congratulations. You've got more time. Um, and I know the bottom line is you'll give patients what time they need, but how we use that time and how we get there is really uh, important and people have different styles. Using good communication skills improves connections, and it basically is just helpful. And these are things that we teach at Quillen. I know that several of you have gone through this as a student. Um, you may have seen it some of interprofessional. I, I hope some of your faculty have taught courses. And there are things like rapport, uh, facilitation, agenda setting, information management, active listening, negotiating common ground. Uh, I'm not going to go into lots of details on them, but they're very useful. I use them every day in clinic. And when I don't, I mess up. I, I miss a connection. I miss something. I have a by the way moment. So it's a really helpful thing to be aware of. And some of these skills, again, they're, they're clinical skills, but it's how do you engage and be present and focus on your patient? A lot of times our chart gets in the way of this. Rapport is all about impressions. How's the office come across? How's your staff come across? If you haven't done it, residents can do this as well, but faculty, Come in the front door and, and act as a patient and just sit and see what your clinic feels like. Is it the impression you want people to have? Is your staff, now this is hard because as soon as you walk in, your staff knows you, but um, you know, are, are, are your environment and your, your staff giving the impression that you want? How do you come across? And a lot of it's how do you start your interview? Um, so I have a scenario for you. So residents, you've got a new patient, nurse has written depression as the chief complaint. Um, how do you do your introductions? So somebody, how do you, how do you introduce yourself? Joe, what do you say? I say, hi there. I'm... Oh, we got an echo. Sorry. It's okay. I say, hi there. I'm Dr. DeFrancesco. How are you doing today? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. You just jumped ahead. So I'll take advantage of that. Um, let me ask, uh, does... Do people automatically know who you are and what your role is? I'm Dr. D. Francesco. I'm a, a psychiatric uh, resident currently working with uh, Dr. XYZ, who is the attending. Um, I'm here to you know, help you out today. So what can I help you out with? Okay. So is that how you really do the introduction? Sorry, we're having issues with volume over here. I hear that, I hear that. And, and, it, and it's tough. So I, I love that you said that. The reality is a lot of times it's, hi, I'm Reed Blackwell, or I'm working with you today, but will anyone else come in? And as a resident, 
it's really important to have that role. I'm working with, with Dr. Shandrea today, and she'll be coming in before we finish. Just prepare people. Because I know, especially when the residents don't say, I'm going to be coming in. When another doc comes in, especially a guy with a big beard and, and long hair, it's like, oh, God, am I dying? What's going on? So being able to say, this is how we function here can be really important for patients to prepare them. Um, and you already said, uh, how are you doing? I love that you said that. What's the right answer in America? When you say, hey, how are you? What are you supposed to say? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay, so how many times are the people in your office that day really fine? Because they're going to go, well, you know, actually, I thought of killing myself. Well, then you're not really fine, are you? But we set that up because that's how we do. It's a knee-jerk thing. I'm not saying don't do it. But when you do it, be sincere. How are you doing? Most of the time, though, you know how somebody's doing. And if you lean forward and go, how are you? That's different than, hey, how are you? So just be aware how you phrase it is really important. Your nonverbal with that is really important. Because what... That doesn't always get you what you want. But what brings you in? What can I do for you? So, Joe, I like that component. How can I help? You know, what's most important for you today? And then as you explore, um, there are other questions. So what's your, what's your next set of questions? Another, uh, another resident. You say, uh, what brings you in? They say, I'm depressed. What do you say next? Praveen, what do you say? Um, so what brings you in today? Uh, how can we help? Okay, I'm depressed. Then what do you say? Uh, so tell me how long you've been feeling this way. Uh, okay, good. What, thank you, what, thank what you for that. How long have you been depressed? That's a, how long have you been depressed? You might have seen that slide. Yeah, use a lot of closed-ended questions. Okay, how long? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Have you had it before? The problem with that is people stop talking. So well, how can I help you? What brings you in? I'm depressed. Tell me about your depression. And then you sit and listen. Don't write in the chart. Listen. And then when they stop talking, tell me more about your depression. Is there anything else about your depression you want to tell me? You get a ton of information. They answer most of your questions. The trouble is, if you use closed-ended questions, you shut your patient up. That's how you take control in 15 seconds. Hey, what brings you in depression? How long have you had it? You now have control of the interview. The patient will wait for you to ask the next set of questions because you're driving the interview. You're basically saying, there's nothing else I want to know right now except how long you've had it. When you say, tell me more, patients have to tell you their story, and you will get most of the information. You've got to ask closed-ended questions, but later on. And I promise you, this makes a huge difference. You've also got to figure out agenda. You have an agenda, and you should. The patient's going to have one, and the electronic record has one, too. Um, you also have only a certain amount of time, and you, you can't get to everything. But you can control them better than you think. This is all the common ground negotiation. So I won't challenge y'all on this in the interest of time, but there are a couple of ways of doing it to be patient-centered. Um, you know, you're gonna outline yours, but patients will surprise you. I'm sure you've all had what are called by the way moments. You think you're done and your hands on the door and they go, oh, by the way, and you go, uh-oh, I missed something. And so the challenge there is exploring for secondary agenda. So after I do, tell me, tell me more. Is there anything else about that? I summarize. Let me tell you what I've heard. And at this point, we've gone through a lot of the main thing. This is a great time to then say, in addition to that, is there something else important for you to talk about today? What else do you want to make sure we cover? That sets secondary agenda. And it really does work. If you don't do it at all, it'll hit you with, by the way. If you do it too early, they'll still do it, by the way, because they don't believe you're going to address their main issue. So these are things that are, are very helpful. And then you can also set your agenda. In addition, I want to make sure we talk about the medication changes or the counseling I recommended. Those are things you can build in. The biggest issue is, is recognizing responding to emotion. And it's easy to do this in ways where you get defensive yourself or you click into didactics. Well, I can see you're depressed, but honestly, things are looking up for you. I see a lot of improvement it's not working because they're depressed. They're not, they're not there. Information does not overcome emotion. And you're not supposed to fix things. And I know you know this, especially in your profession and your, your specialty. You don't fix things. You've got to validate emotion and naming it. You're really down right now. You're really sad. You're really angry. It sounds dumb, but it works. But you then have to be there for a moment. Stay in that moment. Don't immediately provide information. Just go, wow, you're really angry and see where it goes. Read the nonverbal as well as the verbal. Uh, that stating emotion, um, you're usually right. 
more often than not, you know what that emotion is. Uh, so trust your intuition and then just listen. And this is hard. You don't have as much time. It's uncomfortable. The moment you're uncomfortable in an interview, it's probably because there's a strong emotion or there's that intense psychosis, which is extremely uncomfortable as well. But being aware that emotion is, is very challenging. You don't ever understand their, where they're coming from. Doesn't matter if you've had it. So try not to say, I understand or don't be, those don't work. Sometimes you just say, I'm really sorry you have to, to deal with this right now and mean it, be sincere. Um, being supportive, being aware of your own emotions, you're human, you're gonna have buttons pushed and that's fine, nothing wrong with it. Just recognize when it's happening. Um, and that can be tough. There's a lot of uh, people saying, well, this is a bunch of crap. You know, is this supported by evidence? Because um, you've got to practice EBM, which is evidence-based medicine. But I also think you got to have a little common sense in there somewhere. And bedside matter, we know, makes a difference. You had some studies. So let's look at EBM. What is the strongest type of evidence? Anybody, student or resident? I'm going to pick on people. Megan Taylor. Any idea what the is the board kind of question? What's the strongest type of evidence? Um, you said, what is the strongest type of evidence? Yeah. I really don't know. Okay. Um, I normally have you uh, phone a friend or call somebody, but that doesn't work well here. So, uh, um, so I got a couple of students. So Rachel Mullins, do you know what the uh, strongest form of evidence is? Because you've had this lecture before. Um, we're thinking RCTs. Yeah, meta-analyses yeah, meta of randomized controlled trials. Very good. That's the strongest level of evidence. Doesn't mean it's always right, but it's the strongest level. What's the weakest? Anybody? Support. Couldn't quite hear that well, but I'm going to say that was the right answer. Expert opinion. You get a bunch of experts together. The trouble is, while that's weak, it also directs things. Uh, the management of hypertension for 10 years was directed by something called JNC7, which was a group of experts who all the way also had a, a conflict of interest as they were speakers uh, for pharmaceutical companies who were directing care of hypertension. So type four is expert opinion. Now, this is not real, but it's kind of really how we work. The strongest level of evidence is what you believe that others don't. And the weakest level of evidence is what others believe that you don't. And that's really kind of how we often work. It's how politics works right now. Um, so just keep that in mind. Evidence, you like evidence that supports your perspective. And you can find it. That's the good news. There's always something that will support your perspective. The trouble with a lot of this is it's all about getting rid of individual response. But that's all you do. You focus on the individual response in every situation. Um, there is no such thing as an average patient. It's a statistical entity, but we never see the average patient. We see patients who are very individual. It makes it, makes it challenging. But this is where being patient-centered does improve outcomes because you're focusing on that patient. So I'm going to challenge you to reframe things. I don't have a good treatment for advanced Alzheimer's disease, but I have lots of things I can do for you. You, know, you don't treat bipolar disease. You treat patients. And that's subtle, but powerful. And we say this all the time. You refer to patients as diagnoses. And the moment you do that, you're no longer taking care of that individual patient. So be cautious. The, every one of us in, in medicine at every level makes this change at some point for some reason. And I, I would ask you to fight it. It's really important. You take care of individuals. There really is this new model with evidence. The patient-centered interview improves outcomes. Patients who trust their physicians, their clinicians are more satisfied, have better outcomes, have better healing. You can see this as a dose of the doctor. That's that bedside manner impact. There is evidence showing it makes a difference. And in the 2018, in the American Journal of Psychiatry, depression outcome is improved by patient-centered management, including that patient-centered interview. Again, you have data in your own specialty showing this makes a difference. And I'm hopeful you're all aware of this and do it. But each one of you has the opportunity to make this happen in your practice. We also know team-based care improves outcomes. Um, the American Psychological Association has, has written some articles about um, how that improves mental health, not just physical. 2018 World Psychiatry article measured in the improved quality of mental health care when you're doing team-based care. Now, the challenge becomes how do you do that? 
And there are hurdles here, and I'm not going to overcome them. And I, I don't know where you are, but this warrants some discussion, high levels of leadership. I know we're, that family medicine is dealing with this. Um, the Behavioral Health Institute is dealing with this. The Addiction Medicine Fellowship is dealing with this. I'm sure you are as well. How do you do this? Because billing and payment is a big hurdle. Because we do a lot of things we're not paid for, and there aren't clear answers. There's variability by location of service. Are you doing it in-house? Are you doing it um, in a clinic? Uh, where's the, is it a rural site or not? Private practice? Payers do things differently. I hope you are all reviewing your, your payer codes and payment and asking a lot of questions. You should be asking MEAC, but they don't often know the answers. And don't, by the way, residents, don't worry about that. You don't have to know what MEAC stands for, but your faculty and your chair certainly do. Um, they should be able to help, but they've had a lot of transitions. Jody Palaha, who's a psychologist working with the Behavioral Health Institute um, over at the College of Medicine, has found some answers. She was able to get a new psychologist into the Johnson City Family Medicine Program, and they're starting to get paid like years before I was able to do it a decade ago when I was trying to do the same thing. So things are changing. Jody probably has answers, and your payers can help you sometimes. Although realistically, they don't want to pay you more money because the less they pay you, the more they have for profit. And I'm not being facetious. That's a lot of how payers work. Um, but sometimes we do it because it's the right thing. We do it because our patient outcomes will be better. We know that to be true, even if we're not paid. So then we have to decide how do we balance that, especially with resident education and experience. I don't have easy answers. And I know those are the things you're wrestling with right now. But I think we all need to be doing this throughout the enterprise. Um, are you doing? Are y'all doing group visits? Shambhavi, do y'all do any group visits ever? Um, we have had a social worker in the past that did do some group visits. Um, we found that it's difficult to get enough patients to be able to meet at the same time because most of our groups are not psychoeducational as much as therapy groups. So yeah. it is difficult to make that happen. Yeah. And there are always hurdles, but there are also benefits if you can. It usually means, though, at an inconvenient time for us. It's often like in an evening or a time where people have to take extra time, then you have to pay staffing. But there are ways of getting patients in for things you do routinely, whether it's smoking cessation or uh, sleep hygiene management or, or self-care when they're dealing with diabetes or uh, ways of approaching anxiety, you could come up with all kinds of things where you say, I have a spiel I give every patient, let's get them all together. There are ways that group payments, group visits can be paid. So it's opportunities. I struggled the same way. I never made it happen, but it's an opportunity that I think we all need to be considering. Um, we're really looking at this new model of the patient-centered medical home. It changes how we deliver care and how it's paid for if we figure out how to take advantage of it. Our residencies have to be challenged, I think, to meet our responsibility, and I applaud you all for doing that. I think you do a very good job with this, but I also know the difficulty of working with our other programs to make sure we have behavioral and mental health services available has been a challenge over the years. How can we work even better together, and how do we keep graduating um, the workforce that our community needs? We do pretty good with that here up at ETSU. So as we sort of finish up, it's good to know that patients need, for better outcomes, they need health insurance coverage and routine source of comprehensive, coordinated, continuous care. We need to figure out how to work together better, because I know your, your job is not to do all of these things, um, but they need us to work together as a team to really improve that. They need the relationships with us, and they need the right care in the right place at the right time for the right person, because it doesn't always have to be a physician. It can be other team members who should do what in your practice and in your residencies. It's an ongoing conversation that changes over time. Good news is we're never alone. Um, we gotta figure out how we communicate with each other despite having different electronic billing records in all centers. I mean, I'll admit a patient from Kingsport where we use all scripts to a hospital that uses Epic and they don't communicate. So I have to print pieces of paper out to submit to the hospital. And then when they're discharged, I have to get another piece of paper I scan in, it's stupid. So somehow we've got to overcome the limits of that. We've got to avoid duplication of care, fear-based care, and the fragmentation. And each one of us has to be a part of this. What can you do different? Can you pick up the phone and call me about one of my patients? That would be great rather than faxing me a form. You know, how do we do this better? We, we don't really have communication. We don't do that as much as I think we could. So my challenge for you then is what are you going to do different? 
a lot of this is individually. What will you do to become patient-centered on your own? I hope you challenge the system as well, but what can you do? How can our programs and clinics function differently? And this is, this is really an issue for your, your leadership and the residency and the department. You know, how do we find ways of working better together? Please do remember you love helping people. That is why you went into medicine and you do tremendous work um, with some of the hardest aspects of life, which is what's going on with people uh, in terms of, of um, their psychiatric and mental health. It's really difficult, doesn't fix quickly. You've got to take care of yourself, especially when you're taking care of people, it's draining. So what do you do? How do you create a sacred environment for yourself? Because if you nurture yourself, you'll take better care of your patients. And in many ways, your actions and affect speak louder than words. The words are important, but how you say them, what people feel from you is the sincerity there, is the compassion there, that makes a huge difference. So for residents, especially, respect others always, know your role, do your role, be prepared. Be ready, be where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there, be thankful. So we're really getting to do what we've wanted to do. And I have often said what we do is sacred. It's really important to recognize people open their doors to us in their most difficult times. And we should always respect that and be thankful and do everything we can to, uh, to help our patients move forward. Your actions are powerful. So figure out your communication style, see if there's some patient-centered approaches that you could start to use. Be careful about evidence, you want it, but a lot of it's disease-focused and not patient-oriented. So recognize that as well. Find your team, nurture them, and just figure out how you're going to put your heart back into your own um, art of medicine. It's really what it comes down to, and you have the opportunity. Residency is a great time to be developing that in a safe environment. Uh, once you're in practice, you got a whole other set of stresses. You can still do it, but this is a great time to learn from others. So I appreciate the chance to, to, to spend some time with you. I wish we were in person, maybe a, in a future time. And I'm always happy to follow up on any of these issues and reach out if you have questions or comments. Um, but I really appreciate y'all making time for me to come and, and, uh, and be here today.